Join me behind the scenes as I introduce you to my friends, the people who make your favorite films and TV shows, the people who make the sounds of Hollywood. I'm sitting here with Matthew Waters, one of the most decorated re-recording mixers in Hollywood. Um, you have, what is it, 10 Emmy nominations? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I mean, it's I don't know, but I, I, that sounds I, I'll about I'll tell right. you, I looked it up. Yeah, you have yeah. 10 Emmy nominations, awesome. five wins. Yes, that I know. And uh, <laughs> one we're going to find out shortly. Yes. Well, it would be nice. And you are, Matthew Waters, a re-recording mixer. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean that like, Somebody recorded it and they mess it up and you came in and recorded it again. <laughs> when people ask you what you do, what is a re-recording mixer? Uh, well, that is an awesome question. So basically the, what I tell them is, uh, is that um, there's a sound editor and a sound re-recording mixer. And a sound editor play, you know, takes the sounds and puts it in sync to the picture and then what we do as re-recording mixers is takes those sounds and help tell the story that the director or the showrunner wants to tell by manipulating them by spinning them by eqing them by balancing them differently and uh and we want to get as much emotion for that director or uh showrunner that we can so your job if i'm understanding you is to tease emotion out of the story no doubt just by manipulating the levels and the no sonic doubt. quality of the sounds no doubt. One of my favorite uh, moments in my career is uh, we did a um, film called Crazy Heart with Jeff Bridges. And uh, there's a moment where he's on the phone and he's talking to his son and he's on the porch. And so we play the backgrounds, you know, decently loud. The backgrounds meaning like the sounds of the wind and the, the crickets. Wind, the crickets and the and the, and the street and, and whatnot. And and he's just sitting there talking. And as the camera's just slowly get, you know, zooming in on his face, I'm pulling those backgrounds down, backgrounds down, backgrounds down. By the time we get to the end of it, uh, it's just production track running and it's just quiet, but it's so subtle you don't know, but you get so intimate with Jeff on that and his performance. I'm big on performances too. Like, hey, I like to make a, a fun uh, uh, video game out of the sound when I can, but uh, there's nothing like taking a great performance and just trying to um, surround it with stuff. It's good. So the reason I wanted you to be my first guest mm -hmm. is uh, a lot of reasons. You know, obviously you're awesome, but also <laughs> <laughs> <I'm awesome. laughs> you have been sort of a, a player in – my career for a very long time. We have worked on a lot of interesting projects together. One of my very first jobs as uh, a music editor, I think it was the third show I ever, third or fourth show where I was the music editor on, mm -hmm. was Cold Case. That was your only third job? Something like that. Wow. I, lo I actually love these interviews more so I can learn. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> here's, here's my experience. You ready? So I'm coming on at season five, right? You guys are entrenched. <laughs> You have a whole system in place. I don't, I, I barely know what I'm doing. Right. I walk onto the mixing stage for the first time. It's like the second day I'm on this show. We're playing back the mix. You guys have mixed whatever episode it was, yeah. probably episode one of season five. I don't remember. Uh -huh. And I'm watching the show on the big screen. And one of the characters, lead characters, bends down. And there's this giant fart that happens. And I didn't know how to react at all. <laughs> I'm like, there's a fart in the show. Like the character farts. Did nobody hear that or know what is happening? This is awesome. You've never told me this story. It was you had put a fart in to trick the producer. And you were so afraid that you were going to forget to take it out and that it was going to make it to the air. You had like asked everyone in the room, Remind me to take the fart out. I took the fart out, yeah, right? Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Remind me to take I the fart out. I do remember that, yes. God forbid that makes it to air, yes. <laughs> and you were like, this, you know, it was just a joke to make the producers laugh. I had no idea. And yeah, I was yeah. just like, so shocked. <laughs> yes, that is true. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh that's that that's that's the first thing you asked me yeah that was, <laughs> well that was when i met you that's how right, i met right, you right. you're like oh this guy's a no he'll never last oh, uh, and God. 30 years later yeah it was a lot of years ago <laughs> we actually worked on a show the same show before that we just never met each other which was king of the hill 
Oh yeah, yeah, I love that. Yeah, great. Show. That was a really um, interesting experience for me. I was an assistant composer on that show. Oh really? Yeah, we did like four or five episodes of King of the Hill. The one thing that I did love about King of the Hill that I learned all these all these uh, films and projects. It's so fun because they're all new and different. You know, you you don't go to a bank, and you don't work at a bank where you go in, you unlock the door, and you take people's money, and you say good and see you later, and you leave at five. So I find that to be a positive. And uh, so one thing I learned about doing on King of the Hill is because it was so uh, story driven with, and, and with the characters and the writing uh, that no matter what happened, you just had to get away from the dialogue. So sometimes so and I took that actually and used it in Only Murders. That's the style that I would use in Only Murders uh, is on other films. You know, you keep the uh, you kind of keep the narrative going. And even when they're talking, you know, the car goes away and it keeps going or the explosion happens and it keeps going. But on the in comedy, at least what I, what I found that works really well. And I learned this on King of the Hill is. You know, really hit it and quit it. When the explosion happens, we're done with the explosion. It like it never happened. We're getting back to the hearing their voices and hearing their lines. Jokes, jokes. Get to the jokes get to and, the and jokes. don't get in the way from there. I don't care that the explosion happened or the dogs running. I don't care. What's funny is the lines, and so uh, that was something uh, something I took from that. You've done a lot of comedy though, even before yeah. that. You like yeah. Austin Powers? Yeah, yeah, there's somewhere. Yeah, uh, the Wedding Planner, Jackass. Yeah. Jackass. That was so. That was my Jackass was awesome because that was. This is awesome. So Jackass was great because that was my claim to fame. So you know, I I got into this business because someone came and talked to my class in college. So that's been a passion of mine. I, any if anybody ever asked me to talk to their class in college about what I do, I'm there. It's no problem. So I'll go talk to these college kids and stuff like that, and uh, I will uh, say, "Well, anybody seen Jackass?" Oh, I love it. Oh, I did. Well, I did. I did. Bah. Oh, then they're on. So now, fast forward twenty five years later, twenty years later, I tell people, "I go, yeah, you seen Jackass? No, never heard of it." <laughs> and I'm like, "Oh my gosh!" Now it's always like, fleeting. It's always fleeting. Right now, you're forced to say, "Anybody heard of Game of Thrones?" That's what I say. But yeah. but I always use that story because in five more years. Game of Thrones. No, that was cute. You know, something else, something else will take it. You'll have some other incredible project. To, oh, I hope so. To I, brag. I, I, I hope. I'm, I, you know what? I've been really blessed to work on a lot, a lot of great stuff with a lot of great people. So, There's no doubt. So it was like an event in college, a single event that turned you toward this industry. I yeah. I vaguely remember you telling me a story that your first job was picking tobacco. Is that right? Uh, my first job was working <laughs> on a tobacco farm. Yes. I'm from Kentucky. That's that's awesome, too, being from Kentucky and working in Hollywood. Yes, now. it definitely sets you apart. Uh, yes. It definitely. Not a lot yeah. of Kentucky. Who knew there. when you're looking at all these little 12-year-olds working in the tobacco fields that I was the one that went to Hollywood. <laughs> I, I definitely could tell you nobody there thought that was the case yeah um but uh yeah so you know i did i did all that but uh what happened uh for to get started in this career i never knew this business happened which is another reason i love to go talk to like now i go to uh, uh colleges and everybody wants to be a music producer well everybody's not going to be a music producer but you know what there's a lot of cool jobs with the talents that you have and you just need to know about them so that's you know so i'll go and do uh, seminars and, and and just do a lecture or something like that about what i do and that's what happened to me i was a radio television major at san jose state and stephen flick just won the oscar for robocop wow. I, w I was a, a robot the original <laughs> and, uh, and I was, uh, I was a senior in college as I was going to graduate. I was going to go to some small town and be a program director for some radio, radio station. station that, that, that was my track. And so here I am with like two months to graduate cause the, but the Oscars are in February at that juncture. And so he probably came at the end of February, he talks to my class. I'm probably the only one that even listen to him. But he told us what he did, how he made the sounds. Well, you know, we, we put a, a VHS in a, a VHS machine and all the servos and stuff. And that became his arms. And I'm like, what? That's the coolest job in the world. You get paid for that? <laughs> Couldn't believe it. So then, uh, so I said, how do I do this? Now I'm up in the Bay Area at this time and go to San Jose State. And they said, uh, well, you got to move to LA. Well, the Bay Area in LA, mm, it's like... Uh, <laughs> We don't get along so well. So I'm like, LA, are you kidding me? So what happened was I ended up uh, finding an internship and I came down in March for an interview. And of course, I wear a suit to the interview at a sound house in Hollywood. <laughs> 
Boy, did they get a giggle out of that. Yeah. I think I think I was probably the butt of the jokes for a good week after that. But I didn't care. I look solid, man. And so anyway. I'm sure you look great. Uh, well, I've seen you in a tuxedo. <laughs> yeah, you can, exactly. wear, you yeah, can wear a right. tuxedo. So uh, anyway, I ended up getting the internship. So the day after I graduated, I moved to LA, laid carpet for money, and uh, and then interned at this facility. And, uh, you know, way, way my career went. So you started in post sound, really? I did. I came, I came. That's one thing you find out about Hollywood, like, especially even people in sound. Oh, how'd you get in this? Oh, I want to be a musician. I want to be a writer. I want to be a director. You know, not that they're not going to do that, but what happens is when you're not getting paid and then all of a sudden you do something, you get paid, you're like, eh, maybe I won't write. Maybe I won't. Yeah, you know, it's funny. <laughs> I moved here like every other music editor to, to be a uh, film composer. Yes, right. And was working as an assistant composer. That's when I did uh, uh, King of the Hill with right. John Frizzell was the composer I was working for at the time. Didn't even know there was such a job as a music editor. But I also had, you know, this audio engineering background. And here's this job that's half audio engineer totally. and half musician. Yeah. And I was like, well, this, I didn't even know this existed. Like if I, a, we if both I, had a similar, if I'd have known, I might have wanted to do this before I got here. You know, <laughs> right, right. this Oscar award winner comes to your college. Yeah. And now we flash forward. And he brought the Oscar. All these years later, you have, all right, I'm going to get, I wrote this down so that I, I can I get it all. I can't wait to hear this. You have 10 Emmy nominations, five wins, uh -huh. seven of those uh, nominations, and four of those wins are for Game of Thrones. Yes. This uh, mm. incredible masterpiece that you created, the sounds uh, of Game of Thrones. It was, it was a wonder to be a part um, of. You have nine CAS nominations. I have nine CAS nominations. And six wins. Wow. Six Hollywood Post Alliance nominations yeah, that's, that's and one win, one win, uh -huh. one International Monitor Award for Hercules. Yes, I love that. Ready? Show. This is my favorite. This is my favorite. I don't know. That one's pretty good. Two nominations for the Irish Film and Television Awards. I didn't even go. <laughs> they didn't fly you to Ireland for that. <laughs> no, no. Did I win? I uh, I don't think so. Sorry. No. <laughs> <laughs> I hate to break the bad news to you. That's <laughs> okay. That's okay, man. Uh, five MPSE Golden Reel nominations and two wins. Now, the fun about that is the two wins are like 24 years apart. The best which part I love about that, that one mm -hmm. is that your second win was with me. It's, that is the best part. <laughs> that is the best part. Well, you know, that amazed me because you're so talented. Oh, you. Come on. You, I've told you this before. You're so talented and you work on so much stuff that I was shocked that that was your first win. I really was. It, yeah. It's, and uh, so. Well, thank you. Yeah, it was my first, my second nomination and my first win. For, yeah. Uh, Golden Reel Awards. My first one was for Terra Nova. Oh, yeah. yes. Well, many more to come, Mr. Well, that's, I hope so. Uh, <laughs> this year, we just found out that you got nominated again. Uh -huh. This time for Only Murders in the Building. Very excited about that. I am so happy about that nomination. Why? Uh, one, I love the crew and the show. I mean, it has been, uh, I got, I got on this. So here's how I get this gig. I'm sitting there thumbing through the Hollywood reporter and they tell me, Oh, Steve Martin and Martin Short are going to do a TV show with Selena Gomez. I'm like, okay. I'm at the twilight of my career. Let's all be honest. No uh, way. And, just getting started. Uh, <laughs> and I have always bucket list wanted to work with Martin Short and Steve Martin. And they're together. I don't even have to do two different shows. <laughs> right. It's amazing. So I call up my uh, uh, posse of awesome people that helped me and uh, Jackie Jones, Miss Jackie Jones being one of them. So anyway, so I call her up. I say, hey, Jackie, I really want to do this. Do you, do, do you know who I could get in contact with about this? And she says, well, funny enough, you know, something came across my desk from Hulu and it seems like it's the same project. Do you want to do it together? And I said, that's great. And, you know, I love working with you. So anyway, so we went through it together and then I ended up getting the show, which was fantastic. And uh, so it's something I really, really, so it's not something that like I just uh, went as a paycheck or filled in some weeks or whatnot. I really, really wanted to do this show. And in doing it, uh, you know, I met great people and John Hoffman, the showrunner. Genius. Genius. Nice. I mean, I couldn't love that man more. Yeah. He I is mean, the nicest human. Nice and smart. You know, I mean, there's nice people that aren't so smart. 
really. I mean, you could be looking at one of them because <laughs> I'm pretty nice. We don't know how smart I am. There are, oh. <laughs> but anyway, so. Yeah, it's such an underachiever. It's uh, right. So uh, he creates this episode with no lines of dialogue until the end. And we have to figure out as a sound team and the picture department, Ju Julie Monroe and whatnot, we have to figure out how to do, to create this world of a deaf person's perspective and then, and then how to make it not boring and how to tell the story and how to keep it moving forward. You know, one of my favorites is just introducing it. And then when they have the headphone trick, uh, uh, with the music and, you know, we have to hear it because we have to know it's loud, but it has to be distorted. And, and it was really hard to do. And, and, you know, people will watch it and go, well, there's no talking. So, how hard was it? Oh, it was very difficult. And I am so proud of that episode. So I was super excited for not only myself, but my crew, the show, John Hoffman. And I'm really proud of that episode. And, and I'm so happy to be nominated. Well, you deserve it. I think we all are very proud of that episode. Yeah. And, you know, it's funny. My experience getting the job was very similar. Like, I find out that this show is happening. And I call up Stephanie, who's, you know, music editor who works yeah. with me. And I, I was like, Stephanie, we have a new show. You can pick any Martin you want. <laughs> any Martin. She's like, uh, I don't know, Steve Martin? I was like, okay, good, Steve Martin. And I'll give you a bonus Martin. Any, any other bonus Martin that you'd like? And she was like, uh, I don't know, Martin Short? I was like, yes, she gets them both. <laughs> and I was like, I'll throw in Selena Gomez. She's like, what, are you kidding? That's real? That's really happening? Oh, I wanted to show you something that I brought. These are shoes. Do you remember these shoes? No, I never got those. You shoes. Never got the shoes. No, we were. They have. I, these are a pair. Where of, am I? What are these Nikes? Days. Oh no, they're Adidas, Adidas shoes Adidas, yeah. with the with cold case emblazoned on the side. I'm going to be making some calls when I drive home. These are 20 <laughs> years old. I'm kind of upset. I, I they don't fit. I got them too small, so they don't fit. So I couldn't wear them. So they've been sitting in my closet for 20 years. They're and, classics. And today was like the. Oh, I have a reason to take them out. <laughs> Show them to me. And I love the orange bottoms. Yeah, I know, they're great. Man, those are solid. In the middle, mm -hmm. we did this other show. Remember this one? Thrifty Town sweatshirt here from Rectify. Oh, Rectify. Yeah, that was our great and show. Man, we've worked on some great, great shows. Great shows. I mean, really. What you made so me think of Rectify just now when you were talking about only murders, one of the things that they share, which is very rare and unique, and I think it's awesome that we got a chance to do two shows like this, is... You know, when you're a kid, they send you to arts and crafts, mm -hmm. but they never tell you the difference. <laughs> <laughs> and so you think they're the same thing. And you grow up saying, oh, I'm going to be an artist. I'm going to be an artist. And then you find out that a lot of what you do is crafts. Mm -hmm. And like being a master craftsman is definitely rewarding in and of For itself. Sure, yeah. But it's not the same thing as being an artist. And a lot of our jobs are crafts, you know. And then every once in a while, this piece of beautiful art appears. Totally. And Rectify was like, for me, one of my favorite shows I've mm -hmm. ever done in my career yeah. because, you know, we, you could tell from minute one, we were doing something special. We were making a piece of art. It was a piece of art. And Only Murder shares that too. Mm -hmm. Like, it's not just a sitcom. It's a, something special. There's something extra in there that, you know, well, and, everybody feels. Yeah, and even um, to me, Only Murders is also very cinematic. There's a cinematicness to it that, I don't know. It just feels It's great. just somehow bigger than it is. Bigger than it is. That's, yeah. the way, that's a better way to put it. Rectify was also incredible people, which I think is a big part of it. I can tell you after doing this for 30 years, the best stories and films and TV that I've ever done are with the greatest people, smartest people, most confident people. And, uh, and, the, and there's a reason. Those are great shows great films. you know i always say there's like two totally independent metrics on any job you know it's it's funny because in the real world people get a job and they like it and they're good at it you know what they do they just keep it <laughs> <laughs> they don't get fired yeah, every four or, months <laughs> or like sorry your job is canceled go get another one exactly you know oh wow that job lasted uh, three years that's amazing in yeah. hollywood you know it's like well that's you know, that, that's always my joke uh, i'll tell people i go you're fired well in two weeks you are right you know, we, we've got to finish this first <laughs> and like in every job there's these two things that you can measure one is like how good is the show and one is like, how good is the crew? Like, how fun is it to work with these people? Right. You know, and, you know, in any job, whether it, whether it's here or any job in the world, like 
there is the job as it appears in hypothetically to everyone on the outside. And then there's like, you got to get up every day and sit in a, an office with people and interact with them and work with them. And like, you know, I've spent, I don't know how many hours looking at the back of your head. <laughs> totally. Because like, you know, <laughs> on the way the mixing stages are set up, I'm sitting behind you. Yes. And now I'm looking at your face. It's really weird for me. But, uh, you know. <laughs> you didn't know what I looked like. Yeah, I was like, wow, that's Who what it looks you? like. Is weird. Right? Uh, <laughs> but every once in a while, you and, and it can be, you know, those are unrelated. You can be on garbage shows that aren't fun to work on and aren't fun to watch. But the crew is a laugh riot, total fun. Mm -hmm. Can't wait to get to work every day. Totally. And then you can be on these shows where it's torture, but you're really proud of the final product. Mm -hmm. There's those rare ones. And interestingly enough, uh, both of of the our last two projects together, which mm -hmm. are Rectify and Only Murders, are those rare ones where like everybody's awesome, everybody's great at their job, everybody's brilliant and fun to work with, and the product is like matches. It. Yeah, something mm -hmm. you can be proud of. Well, I can tell you, I tell people all the time, uh, you know, we have the greatest jobs, period, and um, I I firmly believe that. And so, I mean, I'm sitting on a massive stage in Hollywood or I'm on a Warner Brothers lot or a Paramount lot or Sony lot, Universal, whatever. And they let me in. <laughs> they actually said, come on in, Mr. Waters. I'm like, what? How did I do that? Yeah, they reserve so, a parking spot for you. <laughs> they reserve. A, and I remember when I came down here as an intern, I couldn't get onto those lots. And I don't take it for granted. Every time I can get on a lot or get into a building that has these stages and I'm sitting, I go, this is our office today? Let's have a good time. Yeah. You know, I mean, look, it's high stress, it's high focus, it's high creativity, high demands. Wouldn't want it any other way. I, yeah. I tell you, the 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 one project, the the few projects I've done where they didn't care about sound are my least favorite. I want the demands. I want them to push. I want them to care half as much about audio that I do. Do you find a lot that you are working with filmmakers who don't care about sound? Not anymore, thank heavens. But yes, I have. And, you know, they're like, are we done yet? Are we done yet? No, we're not. I, I, I find our part of the industry post-production sound, the sound stuff that happens after they're done shooting, people don't even know it. it's happening. They don't even no. realize how much work, how many people go into making the sound. And, you know, I always say sound is half your movie. And then I always oh. say music's half your sound. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> so that'd be 25%. Yeah, I'm a little biased towards my department. <laughs> but uh, you can tell the filmmakers who really pay attention. It's, it's tough. You know, they, 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 especially newer filmmakers, they've never heard these sounds before. Right. It's like so, a, so one of my jobs is, as a re-recording re mixer is to somehow find the line to, to get them used to it. You know, and sometimes it's about level. Sometimes it's about EQ. I mean, that's through experience too. People don't like the sound of crickets. This is what I've learned. People just don't like crickets. So, uh, <laughs> I EQ the, I EQ them to where they're, um, able to be uh, tolerated and, and then they're okay with it. And that's like one of the things that people don't realize, like uh, without a, without fail, anytime it's nighttime on TV or in a movie, you put some cricket sounds in there. So it sounds like nighttime. And anytime it's daytime, you put some wind in there and you put birdies, birdies and whatever it is that's making it mm -hmm. feel real. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, hopefully the production mixer uh, on the day is has the microphone on their uh, vo vocals, on their mouths. Right. You just want to hear the actors. I really just want to hear the actors. Really, we got the rest. We're cool. <laughs> Although I will say, you know, uh, another thing that's uh, happened in my career is, um, is, uh, working so much, I'm getting to know uh, production sound mixers now and stuff. And getting that dialogue going, not to be all technical, but if anybody is listening to this that wants to do what we do, everybody's friendly. If you're working on a film, email the, the production sound mixer, introduce yourself. If you're the re-recording mixer or the sound supervisor, try and get that dialogue going ahead of time. And only murders, oh my gosh, with Joe, Production sound mixer, amazing. And I remember the first season, you know, he calls me up. Hey, Matt, we had worked together a few times. Oh, man, I don't know. This is rough. This is rough. I go, send it to me. Let me listen to it. Of course, he's he's uber worried about stuff. I listen to it. I go, it's great. You keep it up. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. But anyway, but the, the great thing is we were able to work on certain scenes that could have been sound not so good, and we worked together on it. That was, that was the key. Do you have, you, you, you mentioned that, you would you would tell young people like, don't be afraid to reach out 
like yeah. send somebody an email, make a phone call? Do you have I some sort of time. like go to advice for people who want to do what you do? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I do. I do. How much time do you have? No, <laughs> uh, the, the main thing I say is, uh, you know, Hollywood is there's 24 hours a day and there's seven days a week. If you aren't good with those hours, be a banker. Simple as that. Not that you work those hours all the time, but there's many times we'll be on a mixed stage. It's seven o'clock and the director wants to go, I don't know if we're done. I want to finish this reel. Let's stay till midnight. I mean, I remember when I had little babies in the house, I'd call up my wife at 6.45. Uh, yeah, we're staying late. And I'd hear, click. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's going to be tough. But anyway, so uh, uh, um, yeah, so th that's one. And then have a great attitude. You know, you're on these stages. Uh, we have no uh, windows. We have no clocks. It's like Vegas, you know. And you're in there for 12 hours with people. And I don't care how good you are or how smart you are. If you don't have a good vibe or a positive attitude, people won't work with you again because it's too hard. I always say like, this job is supposed to be fun, right? Mm -hmm. And like, if you're not having fun, you're doing your job wrong. Right. You know, That's like, right. it's, this is, when, it's not open heart surgery. Like nobody's going to die. Like right. relax. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, we'll, yeah. We'll get it. We're, 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 here, we're all here to work. And that's one thing too, working with great, smart people, talented people. We all get that we all, you know, I think, I think uh, in my career anyway, it went through phases where, you know, when I first started as a sound designer, I wanted to be, uh, well, when I first started in transfer, I wanted to know everything about frame rates and this and that and all this stuff. And then I, I started to being a sound editor and sound designer and, and I wanted to make the coolest sounds ever. So, you know, it, but it didn't matter what was going on on film. If they closed the door, it was like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, it's the grandma's door. It's fine. She'd never be able to lift that door if you did that. Again. Right. Um, um, and, uh, and then you go from trying to prove yourself that way to finally you get to the point where it's only what's on screen that matters. You don't have to prove you're the best, coolest sound designer. What's the perfect sound to tell that story? And for me, one of the most perfect, there's two sounds in my whole career that just blew my mind. Uh, one I was part of, and then the other one I wasn't, but, uh, Heavenly Creatures, Peter Jackson's film from. 40 years ago uh kid kills her mom with a brick anyway so movie goes and all this stuff and at the end there's a she, the, the daughter has the purse and she puts it on the table and there's a brick in the purse and you just hear clunk and everybody in the theater went oh snap oh, oh it's gonna happen that was a great sound moment and then uh um Oh my God, American, oh my gosh, what was that? But anyway, uh, there was a, a sound of teeth going on a curb, um, uh, curbing it's called. And so this guy, Ouch. and uh, Ed Norton was in it and he, he goes, put your mouth on that curb. And so I was mixing it, but the sound supervisor had the Foley team make teeth on concrete. <sighs> <laughs> Brutal, man. Everybody knew I was going to go out there. So that's fun. That's fun. You know, I, I, uh, I'm a huge fan of Game of Thrones, mm -hmm. and you mixed every episode of that show. Uh, second season on. Second season on, okay. Mm -hmm. You mixed a lot of that show. I mixed a lot. And <clears throat> I, there was a, a moment, I don't remember the character's name, it's like the Prince of Dorne, and <laughs> somebody kills him from behind with a spear through the face. Mm -hmm. And... You know, I'm laying in bed with my wife. We're watching Game of Thrones and the spear goes through the guy's face. And I was like, wait, back it up. I want to hear that again. <laughs> One right. more time. You uh, remember? Yeah. I jump onto social media and I'm link and I'm like, uh, Tim Kimmel and Matt uh, Waters are absolute <laughs> geniuses. You just have to, everyone has to go listen to the spear through the dude's face. <laughs> well, what sound uh, was, was when... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> the guy was fighting the mountain and he, and he took his eye oh, yeah. and, and his head popped off oh, in his head. Oh, right. Gosh, that was so funny. But here's, here's my, I mean, so many great sound moments in Game of Thrones. One of my, but here's a story of about caring what's on screen. No one has any kind of ego. We're all working together. Um, so we're doing this, uh, battle of the bastards. One of the best sounding things I've ever done in my life. Uh, I treasure it. Um, but anyway, these arrows come 
and you know they shoot the arrows and and there's a shot of them coming at camera and uh, then they come down and so the arrows we finally get the visual effect and then there's like probably 10 arrows flying well you know what did we do we put whooshes on it and i remember going uh no 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 let's make this better let's make this cooler and then i was like oh let's do the feathers on the on the arrows and so tim's like oh yeah and all these yeah yeah we're all like oh that'll be cool yeah let's do this one this one we all come up with ideas and tim calls the foley department foley department gets into it oh that's cool we've never done that anyway they put it together well so now when you hear that it's like <sighs> these flutters and i was like no one's ever heard that before that was badass i love that it's funny how like all these details I think in, in my mind, that is the difference between the way things get done in Hollywood and the way things get done everywhere else in the world, which mm -hmm. is everything from the costumes, the set design, the the sound of the feathers on the back mm -hmm. of the arrow. Mm -hmm. There's some team of experts who are paying attention to the details and all of those details add up to this rich, full, real fielding world. And at some point in that process, all of the entire sound team, everybody takes all their work and hands it to you. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then it's on you. Put it all together. Sometimes. <laughs> but uh, that being said, like you look at any of these masterpieces we've worked on and it is, it's the art department. It's the, it's the, 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 all, all the people that do the costume design and, and it's the leadership that, that says, I want these details. I demand these details. You need to do it. I'm not going to micromanage it, you know. And 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 when you get that, man, everybody just pulls and and makes the makes the show the show's great. Now you you wonder if with all those details, Matt, how come you didn't notice the Starbucks cup? Right. Yeah, okay, good point. Good point. <laughs> not my department. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll tell you, you know, you must the, have made yeah, some mistakes. But, but you know the answer to that? What the Starbucks cup never moved. Right. That's why you never noticed That's it. That's why we never noticed The sound it. department doesn't pay attention to inanimate objects. If it's sitting there, what do we care? Yeah, it doesn't make any noise. Doesn't make any noise. But you must have made some mistakes. Uh, do you have any like memorable mistakes? Things that went to air that you're like, I can't believe that went to air? Oh, no. Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> well, mistakes, you know, yeah, no. Mistakes I, are relative. Yeah, right? mistakes are relative. No, hey, look, it, it's all a creative process. Sometimes you go, oh, I wish I would have had another day day on this. I wish, I, you know, when I watch films and I'll sit there and generally, you know, if, if it's a good film, I don't really pay attention to the sound. If it's a not so good film, I might start to listen. And, you know, and I know my, might know the people that worked on it. And I'll be like, oh, man, they wanted one more day with that mix. Yeah. They almost had it. It was almost, mm, but, um, but it, you know, it's, it's all about time. You know, yeah. some, some, I mean, creativity sometimes. is about working within your constraints. Yeah. Well, and people, people will say to me, you know, they'll come and they'll have an indie film, let's say, and then, you know, we have to do it in X amount of time. And they go, we want it to sound like Game of Thrones. I'm like, you know the difference? It's actually not budget. It's time, which is budget. Yeah. <laughs> but it's time. This has been an absolute pleasure. Are we done already? I'm, I've got so many more stories. All right. I'm not going to stop you. Anything else you wanted to say? <laughs> well, I I did want to say, uh, wow, I had so, I, this went by so fast. We should do seven parts. Okay. Yeah. I'll just say one thing. Okay. This is, I'll end with this. Okay. Because it, mm -hmm. you put it in my head and it, and it always made me laugh that, uh, you know, you, so we sit at a mixing console, everybody's behind us. So you only see the backs of our head. Right. So I was working on Hercules, uh, and, uh, Hercules and Xena. And, and then it was funny because, you know, I had a sunroof, I'm in LA and then I would look through the sunroof I'd see in the mirror and it looked like, cause the sun's beating on my head that I was losing my hair. And I'm like going, Oh my gosh. And then I said, screw it, man. I'm going to, I'm going to take control of this. This has nothing to do with sound, by the way. I just want to share this. Okay. <laughs> You're going, where is this going with sound? Well, so anyway. <laughs> the back of your head and sound are inextricably linked in my mind. Exactly. So. so anyway, so I shaved my head. I had a big party, shaved my head. And so I go to work the next day. I mean, I do not look good. I, <laughs> it was a massive problem. However, I felt like I owned it. I'm like, yeah, you know, you can't take this from me. So anyway, so we get done mixing. We're walking out. The producer takes me aside. By the way, a friend of mine. Producer, she needs me on the show. She loves me on the show. She takes me aside. She goes, Matt, come here. I'm like, what's up, Bernie? 
Bernie Joyce, love her. She, I go, I go, I go, what's up, Bernie? She goes, Matt, your hair's going to come back. And if you ever shave it again, I'm going to fire you off this show <laughs> because I cannot look at your bald head for nine hours in a day. And I go, you got it, Bernie. I never shave my head again. That's some good advice. <laughs> That's the advice I give kids. <laughs> All right. That was the last one. I got. That's hilarious. I mean, I've got 400 more. You know what we'll do? We'll, we'll come back when you win this Emmy that's coming up. You know what? It's a gr- look at. Here's the real deal. People say, uh, uh, you know, you know. People always say, "Oh, it's great to be nominated. It's great to be nominated." And the fact is, it is. It's like these are your peers, and they only pick five or whatever, and you're one of them. It's an honor to be nominated. That's what I tell people. And then, but but when you're at the awards, and obviously it sounds strange now because I've had some wins and stuff like that. But if the first one for sure, you're sitting there and you're like, yeah, no, it's great to be done. And then when they start doing the names, you're like, this might be my only shot. I want it. You want it. <laughs> and yeah. then if you don't get it, you're like, oh, it's great to be nominated again. Well, but, the, but it is great to be nominated. The truth is, the truth <laughs> is, and you know, it's very, very hard to get nominated. Hundreds of shows, totally. hundreds of films, thousands of talented people submit their work totally. to get nominated. The odds of getting nominated are astronomically small, you know, unless you're Matt Waters. So. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But the odds of winning are like one in five. You know, yes. winning's not that hard. Once you're nominated, the nominated part really is the hard part, but man, it is a nice to win. It <laughs> is know? nice to win. Well, and, but, but it, it, it is wild when you're up there and you see the talent that you're up against. Even on Game of Thrones, you know, they would show the clips of the other shows and we're like, wow, there's a lot of really talented stuff out here. So, anyway. All right, yeah, I got to get out of here. I'm going to keep talking. Yeah, so. that's, no. <laughs> it's really been great. Thank you so much. And we'll have you. you back soon. Awesome. Thanks, man. Thank you. Appreciate it. It was such a pleasure introducing you to one of my close friends. Can't wait for you to come back. Click the subscribe button. Follow us on social media. And uh, we'll see you next time at the Sounds of Hollywood.